All right. Happy noon, everybody. <laughs> uh, my name is Molly Liddy, and I'm the Urban and Community Forestry Partnership Coordinator for the Virginia Department of Forestry. Welcome to our fifth and final Waynesboro Workshop webinar series. Um, today, we're going to have uh, Dr. Eric Wiseman talk to us about urban tree canopy cover, structure, function, and assessment. Um, I just want to reiterate, you know, huge thank you to the participants that decided to stick with us for all five. Um, it was a really great opportunity and fun to plan everything out and still be able to share this information with everybody in a virtual space. Um, again, thank you Cooperative Extension and also Trees Virginia for helping us make this happen. So if we go to the next slide here. Um, today's webinar, like the other webinars, are approved for one ISA, one SAF, and one VMLA CEU. Um, there is a questionnaire that you must fill out to receive credit. Um, and that will pop up on your screen. If you don't uh, see the questionnaire, please email Trees Virginia. And we'll make sure that you are accounted for. Um, speaking of Trees Virginia, if you have a little bit of extra change, please donate to Trees Virginia. Um, all of that monetary donations will go to our education fund for scholarships in urban and community forestry. And let's see here. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Eric Wiseman is an arborist and associate professor at Virginia Tech within the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree from Virginia Tech and received his PhD from Clemson University. Prior to his academic profession, Eric works in the field as an arborist, and he has been an arborist, a certified arborist, um, since 1998. His teaching, research, and outreach at Virginia Tech focuses on applied science of arboriculture, urban ecosystems, and urban forest management and assessment. He's held numerous leadership positions, and including a really important role as a board member in uh, Virginia's Urban Forest Council, and he has been um, awarded numerous awards for his professional service and outreach programs. Um, he was my professor at Virginia Tech, so um, big inspiration for me and now an awesome colleague. Um, and before I turn it over to Eric, I wanna pass it back to Adam to do some uh, housekeeping. You're muted. Thank you. Oh, there you Thank go. <laughs> you all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the most common phrase of uh, 2020. I think you're muted. So thank <laughs> you, Molly. Um, and uh, just uh, by way of reminder, if this is your first one, would please use the Q&A uh, feature to ask questions. Okay, this bar is probably at the bottom of your screen. It could be at the top of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're using. So the Q&A is what we ask you to use. And in fact, there are a couple of questions there and we will either type the answers or Ashley will facilitate a verbal question answer um, time at the end. But the submission of those questions needs to be done through here just because of the numbers of people that we have on this call. Okay, and also just uh, once again, feel free to use the chat feature and uh, send a message to uh, just the panelists if you want. That's the default. But if you want to send it to everybody, and we encourage you to do that and make some more interactive and select all panelists and attendees. And Eric, I think you looks like you are ready to roll. I am ready to roll. Thank you all for the introduction and the logistics. Adam and Ashley and Molly, appreciate that. I also appreciate being introduced as an arborist and associate professor. That's interesting. I don't know if I've ever had that introduction before, but quite honestly, it's probably the order that I pride myself in of those two titles. Uh, first and foremost, I was an arborist and then I became an associate professor and, um, and still stick to my arborist roots quite strongly. 
So I uh, thank you all for being in attendance today and look forward to talking to you a little bit about urban tree canopy and, and its assessment. And um, just wanted to say that I see a lot of really familiar names in the participants panel. It's been a long time since I've seen many of you in person. So I hope you all are doing well and glad to be the, the last speaker in the lineup here this month. September has flown by here at the university and I'm sure it's flown by for you all as well. Um, so, yeah, you know, Molly was talking a little bit about my, my research enterprise here at Virginia Tech, and I like to say that I'm a master of none of these things, a jack of all trades, but one of the things that I have worked with periodically over the years is with uh, urban forest assessment. And so I got my start with that, actually doing some tree inventory assessments around the state, both with street trees and, and whole municipalities. And then I had a doctoral student a few years ago who had a remote sensing background and he was actually working on our specialized degree in geospatial informatics and analysis. And he was interested in tree canopy assessment and, and got me interested in it. So I would say that, that my one disclaimer here is that I'm not a geospatial analyst or geospatial specialist. Uh, I have a bunch of colleagues who are. I rely on them pretty heavily here at Virginia Tech and elsewhere to keep me informed about this. But you know, ultimately what I really care about is um, being able to use the information that's created from urban tree canopy assessments to inform good policy and management. And I incorporate that into my teaching, I incorporate it into my outreach, and then I advocate for that approach to urban forest management whenever I have a chance, is having that data-driven, information-driven management. Uh, so one thing I wanted to bring up as I'm getting started here, and please be patient with me as I'm doing some various screen shares here, but I mentioned my former graduate student, Juan Huang, and uh, just at the beginning of this year, January 2020, we published some research that was based on his doctoral dissertation. And, and what we did there was we looked at some of the common methods of doing tree canopy assessments using geospatial methods, also known as remote sensing. And so for those of you who are members of the International Society of Arboriculture, you should have uh, free access to this journal. So this is their scientific periodical, Arboriculture and Urban Forestry. So um, you know we're gonna be really hitting the high spots on talking about urban tree canopy today. Uh, this is not gonna be a master class. Um, I could spend an entire day with you all talking about the ins and outs of this. And in fact, it might be something that we aspire to at some point, especially with the assessment techniques, because there's some things that are out there in the public domain that are available that I think are very powerful and could be very useful for any number of individuals, uh, particularly thinking about civic groups and, and, and those types of citizen, citizen science groups, uh, because uh, we, we don't know a lot about our urban forests, at least in any, any comprehensive way. We certainly have one-offs here and there of individual municipalities or even smaller spaces, but uh, there are some tremendous tools out there, and wouldn't it be great if we could understand our urban forests in Virginia on a much more comprehensive, broader scale basis. So I wanted you to be aware of this particular paper. By the way, if uh, there's anything that, that I mentioned today, a resource, a study, et cetera, and it's not evident to you where to find it or you can't find it on your own, please feel free to send me an email and I'm gonna show my, my contact information right here on my opening slide. So let's give the uh, technology a moment to catch up. Here we go. Good. So there you can see my email address, arborist at vt.edu. That'd be the best way to get in touch with me. I try to be uh, as fairly responsive to email and anything that you hear or see today that you want to follow up with me, feel free to do that. Okay, let's go ahead and dive into this then. Let me get acquainted with the controls. Got a lot of things going on here. So the most obvious question that we begin with is what exactly is tree canopy cover? And you probably have a pretty good intuition of what that is. And in fact, this aerial photograph here taken from Google Earth probably gives you a pretty good sense of how we uh, tend to conceptualize and think about tree canopy cover. But if we wanted to get more specific, here would be a definition for you. The layer of tree leaves, branches, and stems that covers the ground when viewed from above. And so as we unpack that definition a little bit, we can point out some of the finer nuances of that definition that become important as you think about not only uh, how tree canopy works from a structure and function standpoint, but also how we assess it. 
So some of these key points are, first of all, that really uh, what we're concerned about or what's important about tree canopy is the foliage itself, the leaves. That is the key component of the canopy because it's doing all of the important ecological environmental things that we associate with canopy. That is providing surface area for shade, for stormwater interception, and for pollution absorption. And the other thing is that, as this photograph shows, we tend to think about tree canopy as being two-dimensional, but keep in mind that it is actually three-dimensional. That is that it has vertical structure. There is height to those trees that are underneath that canopy, and the nature of that canopy is really important uh, in terms of the ecosystem services that we experience. We're just now starting to embark technology-wise on being able to understand the three dimensional structure of tree canopy. Of course, we've studied tree canopy structure for a long time with our boots on the ground, but since we have started looking down upon the urban forest, most of our technology has allowed us to look at it in two dimensions, but increasingly we're able to look at it at three dimensions, and that's going to make the information and the applicability of that information so much more powerful as we go along as technology improves and our understanding of canopy improves. And the final thing that I would point out is that tree canopy is dynamic in both space and time. Uh, we tend to take static uh, shots, snapshots of canopy through our assessments. They do represent one space and one time, but urban forests are very dynamic and therefore tree canopy is very dynamic. Uh, why is that? Because of varying rates of tree regeneration. So the birth of trees, their varying growth rates, uh, mortality and loss of trees, and then whole scale land use changes that in, impact the amount of canopy that's out there in the landscape. So the most basic metric that we use to describe tree canopy cover is typically going to be the percentage of land area covered by the tree canopy. And so what that means is that we're using some type of tree uh, of remote sensing technology to take a snapshot of the canopy and then using computer software to classify the various types of land covers that are shown in that scene and then ultimately quantify them. And so this is a common set of metrics that you might see as a result of a tree canopy cover assessment where the various types of land cover have been distinguished and differentiated through the remote sensing process. Of course, the one big, big metric that we usually care about and focus upon is the tree canopy, but then understand that there are other things in that landscape that are relevant to how that tree canopy behaves, the ecosystem services that it provides. And then another important thing is where are the opportunities to plant new trees? So we call that available or potential planting space. And so what that is, is that is spaces that are not currently occupied by tree canopy, but could feasibly or practically have trees planted there and thereby increase canopy cover. And so in this example here, those light colored green areas, the non-canopy vegetation, probably turf grass, and then the soil and dry vegetation, kind of that tannish color, those might be opportunities to increase canopy cover in this scene. Although this particular residential scene has a quite respectable tree canopy cover at 35%. So what does tree canopy cover do for us? Well, the way that we like to bin or um, segregate these various types of ecosystem services is to look at them through an environmental lens, a social lens, and an economic lens. So what are some examples of these things? This, these are not exhaustive lists, but rather are lists of the ecosystem services that, that we most commonly associate with tree canopy cover, and the ones that I think we're most commonly managing for and hoping to, to receive as benefits from our tree canopy. So first of all, in the environmental ecosystem services, we have stormwater mitigation. 
in the temperate humid areas of the eastern United States where we get lots of rainfall, one of the biggest challenges that we have in urban areas is the quantity of, of runoff that we get and then also the quality of that water that is running off. But by and large, it's a quantity problem and trees are really good, their canopies more specifically, at intercepting or capturing that precipitation before it ever reaches the ground and more specifically reaching impervious surfaces such just asphalt and concrete and building roofs, which ultimately that water runs off to, runs off of, and either has to be handled in a stormwater management system and or finds its way to a natural body of water. And so this has implications both for flash flooding and erosion and ultimately water quality as that water runs across urban surfaces, picks up various types of pollutants as well as heat pollution as well. Another big one in cities is the ability of the canopy to mitigate the urban heat island effect. So this is the buildup of heat in cities because of the absorption and re-radiation of solar energy from built infrastructure, as well as the creation of heat by anthropogenic sources. So thinking about engines running, um, for example. So what trees do in that regard is a couple things. One is that they shade those heat loading surfaces. But the other thing is that they evapotranspire. That means that as water moves through them and comes out through the stomates of the leaves, it's changing phase. It's going from a liquid to a gas that is an endothermic or an energy intensive process. And so it pulls heat out of the atmosphere. So a really important benefit there. Another one is air quality. So air quality, of course, is a major challenge in urban areas, especially along transportation corridors, where we get a lot of noxious gas and particulate matter coming from combustion and in, um, in internal combustion engines. And then we have the carbon issue. So we know that uh, we have accelerating amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as a result of combustion of fossil fuels. Trees and other vegetation through photosynthesis can sequester and store that carbon and lock it away. And so what this does is it provides a negative feedback against that buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then finally, uh, another one is habitat for all sorts of wildlife uh, that, that might be important in any given urban area. One of the ones that I typically like to tell people about is thinking about um, migratory songbirds and how many of their flight has as they go to northern areas to nest after having wintered in southern areas, those are often, those flyways are often passing through urban areas. And these forest patches and even yard trees are important habitat for them to be able to rest and to feed and to seek cover while they're making those long journeys. What about social ecosystem services? So these are the things that people experience um, more directly and have more of a, of a direct impact on their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, tree canopy affects personal health. Uh, there's a lot of research that's being done right now that's looking at uh, variation in tree canopy and how that relates to an assortment of human health diseases, uh, especially lifestyle diseases. Um, we think about things such as heart disease, cardiopulmonary diseases, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, a lot of those have been, um, been linked to tree canopy cover for reasons we won't get in here, but I encourage you to go and study those more. A lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a tendency when you have good tree cover that people will tend to have more active lifestyles. Because there's shade and because there's natural interest outdoors, people tend to want to uh, be more likely to get out and move around when they can be in the shade of trees and they can look at interesting leaves and bark and the wildlife that's attracted there. Another one is eco-literacy. So the opportunity to take young people outside and take them to a woodlot like you see in the photograph here and teach them about nature and give them firsthand experiences with nature and learn about biology and physics and chemistry and all of these really cool things uh, that make them um, better citizens of the natural world when they grow up. Tree canopy also gives us a sense of place. If you think about uh, any particular space in your community and one that uh, you're particularly fond of, one of the reasons that uh, you're fond of that space is probably because of the green infrastructure, the natural features, and uh, tree canopy plays into that. And then finally, uh, one that's 
become increasingly important in recent years is the recognition of the injustices and the inequities that often exist in urban areas because of past history and past policies um, that created natural spaces or environmental spaces that didn't have a lot of nature in them for disadvantaged communities. There's a lot of research being done on that right now and understanding how that has negative spillover effects into other aspects of people's lives. The ability of, to young, of young people to learn, um, the ability ability of adults to, um, to, to avoid chronic diseases, uh, the ability to be able to afford your air conditioning bill because you don't have as much tree canopy cover in your neighborhood and therefore it's a lot hotter because of the urban heat island. And then finally, the economic bend here. Uh, tree canopy has economic benefits, and this is one that we oftentimes need to put some focus on because ultimately decision makers are often making decisions and setting policies on large scales that are driven by economic decisions. So there's a lot of uh, existing and emerging data out there about the real economic benefit of tree canopy when it comes to cost savings associated with public health the ability of trees and green spaces to attract people to uh, cities to take part in tourism. Uh, the presence of trees having an impact on retail commerce or attracting big businesses to cities and they want to set up their business in a place that's going to have a high quality of life so that they can attract a very talented um, human resources pool. The effect of trees on real estate values, very strong linkage there. Uh, having high quality trees in the right places is typically going to in, uh, increase the appraised value of, of residential real estate. And then the energy savings that I mentioned a moment ago, um, being able to take advantage of the cooling effect of trees can have a big impact on building energy consumption. So why do we focus on tree canopy cover when there's so many different things about the urban forest that necessitate our time and our attention and our management? Well, probably one of the big reasons is that tree canopy cover is a fairly straightforward concept. And then the metrics that come out of it can generally be understood well by the general public uh, and then the people that they uh, uh, um, um, end up electing to elected office at the local, state, and national level. And so to put a finer point on that, um, the other reasons are that we know that tree canopy cover is strongly linked to urban ecosystem function as well as human, human well-being. Some of the examples that I gave you just a moment ago. Tree canopy cover generally speaking, can be efficiently quantified and characterized over large geographic areas, especially when you contrast that with the alternative urban forest assessment method of doing a field inventory, uh, which, which creates a very useful type of information, a very different type, complementary type of information, but is very labor and time intensive. And taking a snapshot of tree canopy cover and land cover can be done fairly quickly and efficiently over large geographic areas and with increasing spatial resolution. And what I mean there is being able to di differentiate what it is that you're seeing on the ground, being able to distinguish trees from turf and other types of land-based features. And then finally, because this data is uh, created over large geographic areas and can be combined with other types of information in GIS, it becomes very powerful for municipal land use planning as well as setting environmental policy. So is all tree canopy cover the same? When you look down in one of those aerial photographs from 30,000, 60,000 feet, whatever it might be, maybe even out in space, from a satellite image, uh, you may have the perception that all of that canopy is the same, but there are important differences within an urban area that matter ultimately when it comes time to set policy and then manage that resource. For example, there are land use differences. Um, different land uses occur, residential, commercial, industrial, and undeveloped, and the character and the function of the tree canopy that ex uh, resides in those spaces oftentimes is distinctly different. So being able to understand that difference and differentiate it can be important from a management standpoint. There's also smaller scale landscape differences. So is this canopy associated with trees that are in a, street, a streetscape or a parking lot 
or someone's yard or out in a park or even in a small forest patch that is a remnant vacant piece of land. Um, all of those are going to impact what types of trees that you find there. It's going to affect the vertical structure of the canopy, but it's, and it's also going to affect the type of ground cover that's there. And so that ground cover has impacts on um, how trees thrive in those spaces, but then also how these various biochemical processes like water cycling and nutrient cycling, how those happen. They vary quite distinctly across different landscapes. There are also species differences within that canopy cover. So generally speaking, are we talking about evergreen or deciduous canopy? Uh, that evergreen canopy um, is important because it can provide year round ecosystem services. When you retain leaf area, it doesn't stop raining in the, in the winter time, right? And so there's still stormwater runoff in in the winter time, well, having a good composition, a good mix of evergreen species will mean you have more leaf area year round. Um, are they needle versus broadleaf trees? Broadleaf trees tend to have the best stormwater interception um, as well as the ability to cast shade, but then there might be some liabilities associated with those broadleaf trees. Perhaps that shade is too dense. Perhaps it will it, it disrupts passive solar heating in the winter times, whereas uh, this, uh, um, if it's a broadleafed evergreen tree versus a broadleafed um, deciduous tree, those leaves drop off. Well, now that's getting sunlight to uh, the built surfaces, and that helps with passive solar heating. And then structural differences. So I mentioned earlier about the fact that tree canopy is three-dimensional. There is absolutely vertical crown structure. If you think about a typical forest, it's going to have a shrub layer, an understory, midstory, and overstory. Oftentimes we don't have that vertical structure in urban forests. If you think about streetscapes, for example, usually the vertical crown structure consists of just one layer, the overstory. There is no understory or midstory, so there's less structural complexity. Of course, you can't have that structural complexity because the trees have to be compatible with the land use, but in places where we can have that vertical structure, it can be important for a lot of different functional reasons. And then I mentioned the ground cover type earlier. And then finally, functional differences. Uh, where that canopy is and how it is intermixed with uh, green, uh, with, with gray infrastructure and human activity is going to impact the magnitude of the ecosystem services. So canopy cover, for example, that is overhanging impervious surface is going to ha have a much more important role in stormwater mitigation than tree canopy cover that is over lawn or maybe out in the midst of a park where it is very distant away from any um, impervious surfaces or any surface bodies of water. And so the same thing could be also be said for the absorptive ability of the vegetation. So trees right up next to the street side are going to have a much more prominent role in absorbing gaseous and particulate pollutants than trees that are further back away from the roadway. Um, and those, those trees next to the roadway are also going to be important for buffering the sound of, of vehicles and buffering um, the, the lights coming off of, of vehicles and so forth. And then the habitat piece as well. Um, you know, dead trees, we don't oftentimes think of them as being um, important in canopy cover, and certainly they don't retain leaves, but dead trees are important for wildlife habitat, and having dead trees as a component of tree canopy cover where it is safe to do so, um, that it's, is an important element of the ecosystem services of canopy. So a little bit about the status of urban tree canopy cover. First of all, looking at the United States. Um, this graphic that you see here is the continental United States, and it's a study that was done, published back in 2018 by David Nowak and Eric Greenfield, both with the U.S. Forest Service. They are urban forest scientists. And so what they did was they looked at land cover data, and they did a change detection between 2009 and 2014. So this is a little bit old, but it still has relevance conceptually here. So they looked at this five-year snapshot. They compared tree cover in 2009 versus tree cover in 2014, and then they rated the percent canopy loss on a state level across the lower 48 states here. And so if you look at the um, 
the legend here, what you will see is that all of these are negative numbers. In other words, they are gradients of canopy loss. And so really the only, only a couple of states in the uh, Midwestern United States had what was essentially a uh, no net loss in canopy cover over that time. But then all of the other states, they had a measurement that ranged anywhere from um, about 0.09% up to almost 1% in tree canopy cover change. And then um, the, the, the states that have this cross hatching in them, they were actually able to detect a statistically significant difference. So in other words, the number in 2009 and the number in 2014 was actually statistically real. Um, so what were the outcomes of this study when you start breaking it down into uh, fact, facts and figures here? They determined that across the entire United States in lands that were classified as urban areas, that the rate of decline over this five-year period was about 130, 30, 138,000 acres annually, or about 28 million trees per year. They also looked at the ecosystem services that were lost as a result of that lost canopy cover, and that totaled to about $96 million per year over that five-year period. If we look specifically at Virginia's data from that research, Virginia lost about 4,200 acres of urban tree canopy cover per year over that five-year period. And that equated to about 878,000 trees per year, an ecosystem service value of about two and a half million dollars. So we know that urbanization um, by and large is a positive force for our society, for our community. It creates economic opportunity. It creates social opportunity, uh, but there are costs for the environment. And uh, what we want to try to do is understand uh, what the costs are associated with urbanization so that we can do a rational benefit cost analysis and understand uh, what are we gaining, but also what are we giving up. So looking at Virginia uh, a, a little more closely here, it's interesting that Virginia is a very treed state. Right now we have about 66% of Virginia's land area has tree cover on it. This is based um, on some research that was done by David Nowak in another paper. This is older data. This is the most recent thing that I could find. This dates back to 2012. Um, but by and large, we don't yet have a lot of urban area in the state. So you can see that um, of, that, of that tree cover across the entirety of the state, so all of this green here, only about 6% of that is presently classified as urban tree canopy cover. In other words, being within the geographic bound of a municipality. But in our urban areas, we do really good relative to other states when it comes to our amount of urban tree canopy cover. I didn't show the stat on the previous slide, but um, nationwide, the average UTC in that study uh, came in at right around 39%. So in Virginia, we're setting at 45% in urban areas, uh, but we can't be complacent because the thing is, is that much of that canopy cover is on lands that are vacant lands at this point. They have yet to undergo development. So that means that those forest lands are very vulnerable and we have to keep an eye very closely on um, land use and zoning and zoning policy so that we make good choices about how we retain canopy cover as our cities grow larger in size across the state. So that 45% canopy cover, um, that's about 772,000 acres of urban tree cover. And if you're interested how many trees are standing underneath that canopy cover in urban areas of Virginia, it's about 166 million trees. So tremendous resource, a highly valuable resource. Uh, certainly something that should keep us all quite busy who are working in natural resources generally and urban forestry specifically. We have problems with canopy cover distribution and equity of that distribution in Virginia, as many states do, and we look at our ultra urban areas. 
Um, Richmond has gotten a lot of attention over the last couple of years because of some of these disparities and uh, how it breaks down along socioeconomic and racial and ethnic lines. And then what are the human consequences of that? I talked about some of the challenges that we uh, are experiencing and have faced and we need to reconcile with environmental injustices um, in situations where disadvantaged and underserved populations tend to be congregated in places without much tree canopy cover. So this was an article that ran in the New York Times a couple years ago, and it showed a heat map of Richmond. And the intensely red areas is where the afternoon temperatures were much, much hotter than the cooler, cooler outlying areas. And so what we end up seeing in Richmond and many municipalities is that there's a strong connection or correlation between um, that heat, that canopy cover, and concentrations of minority populations and economically disadvantaged populations. So the next frontier, so to speak, in urban forestry is to see how can we address some of these disparities, um, not only through assessing tree canopy cover, but then prioritizing and strategizing for where we put canopy cover in the cities of the future. I know there's a lot of questions coming in on the chat box um, and I'm just gonna keep moving along here so that um, we can get through. I'm gonna, there should be time here at the end for us to talk about some of these things. Um, so just hang tight with me, I appreciate your patience. So what are some of the threats that we see to tree canopy cover in Virginia and other places? Um, I would categorize these as direct effects. In other words, um, threats that are associated to how we urbanize land, but then there are some indirect effects that are a result of urbanization and result of people's impacts on the environment more broadly. And so some examples of the direct effects include forest land conversion, so creeping out into existing forest lands through sprawl, and then the obverse of that would be infill development, so densification. And this is a real conundrum because we want densification, but when densification occurs so densely, uh, like what you see here in the photograph, uh, there's essentially no space left for growing large maturing, large canopy trees. And so many municipalities are grappling with what's the appropriate level of densification so that we can have an appropriate amount of green space and green infrastructure in cities, but yet not, not gobbling up all of the peripheral forest lands that we need to keep in rural land, forest land uses for their importance uh, for timber production, for outdoor recreation, for wildlife conservation, and so forth. Uh, but some other things include that we, we, generally speaking, we don't do a really good job purposefully planning for green infrastructure. Understandably, most of our focus goes on planning the gray infrastructure, and the green infrastructure is sometimes somewhat of an afterthought. We need to be more purposeful, mo more proactive, more focused on that aspect. And then when we do incorporate green space, we're oftentimes not adequately designing it. So in other words, um, not thinking very uh, carefully about soil volume. Soil volume is really important for growing large, long-lived, healthy trees. And that's going to be the formula for increasing the extent and the continuity of your tree canopy cover. Um, but the reality is, is that space is a premium in urban areas. And we oftentimes don't have the wherewithal, we don't have the resources, we don't have um, the proper political power to be able to ensure that we get suitable soil volumes for trees. And then that just uh, plays itself right on into the fact that once trees are or green, green uh, infrastructure or in the landscape, we often don't have appropriate resources to manage it. So trees get neglected. Um, that means that they end up ultimately being unhealthy or unsafe. And we have to, we either lose the trees through mortality or uh, trees have to be cut down because they become structurally unstable and become hazardous. And then when we are developing land or we're uh, repairing infrastructure. Um, oftentimes we don't follow the best management practices for tree protection. So uh, thinking about that very important tree protection zone, um, making sure that it's the appropriate size and making sure that it is uh, properly delineated to keep out activities that could potentially harm tree root systems and the soil that they occupy. And then um, 
and then we and then the indirect effects um, would be things that result of, of how humans interact with the environment. So how is climate change impacting the habitat suitability range for various species of trees? In various parts of the country, we're seeing a greater incidence of extreme weather events. Uh, how do they impact the, the health of trees? Introductions of invasive pests, invasive pests, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle lurking out there right now that is going to be a true pestilence if it comes to Virginia. Uh, in, any number of invasive plants that are deteriorating the habitat quality of the urban forest. And then just a whole host of urban stress factors that result from um, building gray infrastructure in cities that make the habitat less suitable for trees. And so ultimately, um, the question that you might ask is, will we conserve tree canopy cover in this state as we urbanize? I don't know if you have seen this interactive web map that the Department of Conservation and Recreation just recently released. I would encourage you to, to go and see if you can find it. But one of the layers that they have in there is a development vulnerability model. And so as you see intensively, intensive shades of orange and red on the map, the red is what has essentially already been lost, so to speak. So that's where urbanization development has already occurred. But then the, the orange shades and the yellow shades are where the vulnerabilities uh, you know, uh, really exist. And I would encourage you to take a closer look at that and, and look where those oranges are. They're both on the periphery of our urban areas as well as intermixed in them. And so how do we sustain tree canopy cover? Well, it's quite simple. We need to conserve our existing cover. So in other words, take care of what you've got, but we also need to establish new tree cover. Trees die, trees uh, are displaced, trees fall apart. And so if we're not actively planting trees, if we're doing nothing, typically we're going to see diminishing tree canopy cover because there's not a lot of natural regeneration recruitment in urban areas. Many of the trees that account for the tree canopy cover, especially in highly urbanized municipalities, those trees come about through planting of trees. So I'm gonna skip through these couple of things to keep us on task um, to move into the last piece here, talking about how tree canopy cover is assessed. Um, by and large, what we're doing these days is using the tools and technologies of remote sensing. That is using some type of instrument that is in the sky, whether it be a drone or an airplane or a satellite, to collect imagery, so taking photographs of the earth, or using lasers to scan the surface of the earth so that we can see the third dimension of, of space. Um, and then using that, that imagery and LIDAR and computers to analyze the landscape and ultimately create a land cover classification. So this is a sequence of images that are taken from the University of Vermont and some of the work that they've done for the, the Vermont Department of Natural Resources and their urban and community forestry program. But it shows the typical progression here. At the top, you have your hyperspectral imagery. So that would consist of a visible light, red, green, and blue, as well as an infrared band. So this is an infrared image that you see here. And what you notice the vegetation really pops out um, and that makes it much easier for the computer to be able to distinguish the tree canopy from the gray infrastructure. Increasingly what we're doing is we are combining that hyperspectral or uh, visible light imagery with LIDAR so that laser scan and that allows us to dif better differentiate trees from other types of vegetation, low story vegetation, because trees get tall, whereas turf doesn't, except in my yard right now, because I haven't mowed in a week and a half. And then ultimately, uh, you, you get the computer gives you a land cover map. And so the computer looks at each and every one of those pixels and decides which of various land cover types are they. And then the real power of this becomes when it gets incorporated into a GIS. And so then you can take that land cover map and then you can overlay it with the parcel boundary lines of a municipality. You can overlay the streets, you can overlay other types of geographic data. And um, ultimately what we end up getting, the product, 
is data, statistics about our urban forests. So this is taken again from the University of Vermont where they've shown the relative tree canopy on a percentage basis on various types of land use. Um, so city owned property versus residential property versus street rights of way property. And that becomes information that informs uh, land management. So the cost. These tree canopy assessments are very powerful, very informative, but they can be very expensive. Um, this is uh, infographic taken from a company called Planet Geo. Very good company, does very good work with tree canopy assessments. Uh, but they put this out there to show you that the big things that you're looking at in terms of cost are first of all, the size of your study area. So the larger the area, the more expensive. And then the com complexity of the project is gonna drive the cost. And so on the upper end for municipality, one of these assessments might cost in the range of 60 to $100,000 perhaps down to five to $20,000 for a relatively small area or a very limited assessment scope. Um, so there are some low cost alternatives out there. These are the things that I would love to be able to present to you all in a workshop sometime. Uh, these, are, these are resources that are on the web and are out in the public domain. iTree Landscape, developed by the US Forest Service, um, what this product is doing is it's taking previously analyzed wall-to-wall -wall classification maps from the National Land Cover Database, so those big 30-meter 30 30 pixels that cover the entirety of the United States, as well as for some places, one-meter high-resolution imagery. They package them into a data viewer. So this is a land cover viewer. It's not an analysis creator. All you're doing is querying this existing data. Um, so that is a limitation, but there are a very broad array of geospatial layers in there. And the ones that I think um, are most powerful are some of the Census Bureau data. And so this is a, a capture of Richmond. I know that I'm running up against the clock, Adam. Just hang with me. There's a couple more quick slides. Um, showing two census block groups, so a geographic boundary in the US Census Bureau, one that's out in a leafy western suburb, one that's more of an inner city core. Um, the minority population here, about 80%, here about 80, uh, about 8%. And then you can see the disparity in the canopy cover here. Um, this is an oversimplification of this. I don't want to uh, muddy the water about the, the linkage between socioeconomic class and rest, race and canopy. But to, to the point here about this, about this software is that it allows us to be able to evaluate on a fairly narrow geographic scale um, some of these types of interesting patterns that we see in urban tree canopy cover. So with iTree Canopy, you actually can create your own urban tree canopy assessment. What you're doing there is you're using photo interpretation. You as the analyst are looking at screenshots that the computer is randomly sampling from a scene in a study area. And then you are classifying based on your visual interpretation of that photograph. And so this is a little screenshot of, of one that I did here in that leafy western suburb. And you can see there's a lot of tree canopy cover there up around 50%. Uh, the cool thing about iTree Landscape as well as iTree Canopy is it tells you the canopy, but then it also tells you the benefits of that canopy. How much stormwater, how much air pollution, what is that worth in dollars and cents? Uh, the one thing about iTree Canopy is that it does have sampling error in it. It's based on statistical sampling. So that's what these error bars are that you see right here. So there is some statistical uncertainty, but it is relatively quick and technically accessible. And then the last thing that I'll say here is that one thing that I'm really excited about that's out there right now put together by some folks cooperating in the Chesapeake Bay watershed is this free standalone software called Land Image Analyst. You can download this software. It runs as a desktop application. You can acquire your imagery. So here's a clip of some infrared imagery. And then you can do 
this supervised classification, wall-to-wall -wall classification of a landscape, much like we see with that Cadillac version, uh, you can do that on your, on your desktop. Um, there's, there are going to be some technical limitations to it. A lot of it has to do with your capability as an analyst, but I think that this is something that's really going to empower municipalities in the coming years um, and citizen scientist group to do some of this wall-to-wall -wall classification um, that is so powerful and so informative. So there we go. We're into the question and answer mode. Um, appreciate your time and attention. I know that was kind of rapid fire at the end. Um, we were a little, little slower getting started than I anticipated, but I'll open up the floor for some questions and I'll let uh, Ashley or whomever on the panel do some moderating for me. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Adam. This was, this was a very informative. Eric, sorry. I am so of course, Adam, too. He's done a great job. Thank you, Adam. That's exactly right. Yes. Th thank you, Eric. <laughs> Let's get into the question since I'm stumbling on my words. Um, what is the optimum percentage for tree canopy coverage in a given area? So oh, wow. Great question. Urban right. versus so, suburban. Well, you know, um, American Forests, back about 15, 20 years ago, they came up with a set of guidelines for the eastern United States and said that um, a typical municipality ought to be aiming for 40% canopy cover, and it ought to comprise about 50% in suburban residential, about 25% in, in urban residential, and about 15% in commercial and industrial. They backed off of that because people um, we're, we're taking that guideline and running it into the ground to a fault. That is, um, they weren't evaluating that, that guideline in the context of their local conditions. And so they were setting unrealistic expectations and goals for themselves. Um, the bottom line is that you need to understand what you have based on an assessment and then start setting some goals for what you think would be achievable for your municipality based on the natural characteristic of that landscape and based on the, uh, the opportunities that you have to plant trees, both in terms of space, but as well as resources to establish and maintain that tree cover. Our next question, they're saying they live in a development that has, uh, I guess, an area, area that has hurricane issues. Um, so they're saying currently it's a negative to, for, to selling a house if it has large trees around it. Yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, this is one of the interesting uh, human phenomenons that we see um, as extreme weather events become more common and more severe is the very understandable trauma that's caused when trees are lost. Um, there is very real consequences to those tree losses. And in the near term after one of these events, there's oftentimes a lot of, of backlash. Um, people start uh, cutting down trees in many cases unnecessarily. So they're making unqualified judgments of the trees and, and their structural stability and um, are, are cutting down trees and we're losing canopy cover. That is something that I think that we need a lot more research on and a lot more public education about. Um, people are making um, what they perceive to be rational decisions based on the best available information, but the best available information isn't the best information for those types of decisions being made, in my opinion. I don't fault anyone for those types of decisions, but we need to do better. So our next couple of questions are asking if you have uh, resources or sources of literature that you could share uh, that uh, talk about that talk about the interaction between tree canopy health act, health and activity levels and um, economic benefits yeah yeah so out of the university of washington um, they have done quite a bit uh, of the work out there um, so someone remind me maybe molly or adam uh, the the professor there at the university of washington uh, who does a lot of this social science research as well as uh, yeah. research. Kathy Wolf. Kathy, Kathleen Wolf, thank you very much. But also um, in the Northeastern Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service, so Justin Morganroth, he's doing some of this research as well. Um, so I would say do a Google search on University of Washington, Kathleen Wolf, or U.S. Forest Service, Justin Morganroth, and you're going to get into the research that they're doing associating canopy cover with social outcomes. You have a uh, few trees, uh, evergreen or deciduous, deciduous that you recommend for large paved areas. 
Well, you know, I, I think that whenever feasible, whenever possible, we should be trying to plant large, large maturing, long lived trees with the understanding that they need to be structurally sound species. And so, you know, I tend to think about our native oaks, for example, they're not gonna be appropriate for every planting situation. They do create litter, they do attract wildlife, um, and they do get very, very large, and that could be a liability. You know, look at many areas in Richmond um, with the towering willow oaks and some of the challenges that has created um, when those trees have overmatured and become a liability. Um, but I would say, generally speaking, across the state, that our native oaks are in the right place, are, are one of our best performers for getting extensive, long lived, resilient canopy. So there's two questions on uh, what's the definition that, that the researchers are using for an urban area? So that's typically based on the U.S. Census Bureau. And so uh, that definition has waffled over the years. It used to be um, based on a population density level, and I can't quote you the number. But in more recent years, they've just been identifying what they call urban areas and urban clusters. And so as long as a geographic area has a certain minimum population, then it gets classified as an urban area. For the most part, what NOAC and Greenfield were using is they were looking at urban areas and urban clusters. So if you Google that and you go into the U.S. Census Bureau, you can actually find maps of urban clusters and urban areas in the United States, and you can start to get a sense of their distribution across Virginia. Are there tools available to talk about the quality of tree canopy versus quantity? the quality of tree canopy. There's some of that built into iTree landscape. So what they have underpinning some of those land cover maps is the FIA, the Forest Inventory and Analysis data. So those are ground-based plots. Uh, that program has been in existence for decades. But over the last decade, they have started to, to run what is known as the Urban FIA program. And so what they're doing is they're slowly rolling out in major metropolitan areas, the same sequence, the same system of setting up these field plots where they then go in and they inventory the trees. So they're measuring the size of the trees, the species of the tree, the condition of the tree. And so that being layered into iTree landscape, you can look underneath that canopy and see the species composition uh, that comprises that canopy. It's not available for many places yet, but that is only going to become more available in iTree landscape as more urban FIA is done. Are there any, is there any modeling available to predict um, future tree cover in 10, 20, 30 years in urban areas? Um, not that I'm immediately aware of. Um, there has been, um, let me try to, so Planet Geo, Ian Hanau, that company that I mentioned just a, a while ago, one of the products that they make for some of their municipal clients is they will have a prognostication tool in there. And so what they do is they look at the existing cover and they make some assumptions about rates of planting and rates of mortality and they will make predictions of tree canopy uh, decline or stability for that matter. But I'm not sure if there's any type of tool that's out in the public domain. And our next question is, uh, how can a community address uh, tree health and cover to ensure we have the appropriate balance between large trees and trees that need to be removed due to health issues? Yeah. Well, first of all, try to get an urban forester or arborist on the municipal staff. If not that, then try to get a tree board or a tree commission established. So that'd be individuals who have a vested interest and oftentimes some level of expertise about the urban forest. Um, you have to have you have to have a combination of experts and advocates, individuals who who understand urban forestry, but then can also communicate uh, both with the general public as well as politicians and decision makers in the municipality. Um, you have to have some level of professional management of an urban forest and. Unfortunately, in, in many uh, emerging urban areas of Virginia, we, we just don't have that human capital in place. And I say that with the respect to understanding that we have a lot of private sector arborist tree care professionals out there. I'm not discrediting you all, but rather I'm talking about someone who is working with uh, the public sector, so the public urban forest. Sorry if that was not clear. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Molly, any final words from you? Um, yeah. 
uh, Becky mentioned it in the chat, but if you weren't monitoring that, um, prior presentations um, have been uploaded to our YouTube page and uh, they can be found either by Googling or you can visit the latest news tab on the Trees Virginia website. Great. Well, okay then, thank you very much. Um, this has been a great series. Thank you Department of Forestry for uh, organizing it. Eric, thank you for the strong wrap up and, um, and thank you for allowing Extension to be part of it uh, and facilitating with the technology and such like that. And we hope to see many of you face to face sometime soonish. Until then, be well, stay safe, do good stuff thank with trees. Thank you. Hope thank to you. see Bye. some people in person soon. Take care.